You're still in Ohio? Oh, I didn't know that. I thought you left Ohio. Can't wait. Not really. I don't know. Um, it, it's, a sum, it's my summertime lover. But doesn't have heat. The farmhouse doesn't? Farmhouse, no. Oh, okay. It does. It has a furnace, but the mice got in it, and I don't feel like turning on the heat when there's mouse turds in the <laughs> So you have two studios then, right? You have one in the farmhouse and one in Cincinnati? Well, studio, ha ha. Here's my studio. I have board will travel. Oh, really? You just use that? And I, have, um, I have a set of, well, I, this drawing table here, uh, a lady threw it out in, in Kentucky, and it was her son's little drafting table, and I turned it into a kitchen table. And then I thought, wait a minute, it's a drafting table. You know, it's a little cheapy thing that you, people buy their kids. <laughs> And so, um, but then I liked it because it was child size, it's small. And so then out, I, it, and it tilted at the right angle. So I modified it a little bit, I put my own board on it. And then I have this board I've had since, oh God, I've had this guy forever, this thing here. Mm. So, because I put, um, and then I have a heating pad underneath it so that it warms up the board so my hands stay warm. Cause I don't care, My I just have bad circulation or something, I don't know. But then I have these things here, hold on, pages. There's a lot of junk in here. I have um, made these tilters. I don't know if you can see this. See this, it's a tilt thing. Oh, that's nice. So, um, then I can take this, I'm gonna be in a different room or something, and then I put the board on this tilter. Yeah, yeah. And then oh, this can go anywhere. And so at the what I've done is here, yeah, here I've got the the I take this little guy back and forth, this little drawing. It turns out to be the best one I've had. I, I used to do uh, straight, just a table, and then I put a tilt. Put one. I have a couple of these tilter things. I put some of that. Now I've made a mess here. Um, so it just depends on. Uh, but out there, it's so. What I'm saying is, it's easy to set it up. It's easy to move it. Have drawing table will travel. Yeah. It can be here. It can be there. Just throw it in the car. Throw it in the back of the truck. So this is a. It's small. But the other thing you can't see because I'm not. Not gonna move the thing. All the inks and the pencils and you know all the brushes and inks and yeah, you know, all of that that's on the right side because you're right-handed. All that right side stuff. Yeah. That is um, it's just modular. Like I have this. I have over here. You can't see it, but there's a place for things like this. Yeah and this you know so it's got some sh some shelving for for these things uh exacto blades and then my dictionary and thesaurus are here and the brushes and the ink are over here and so as long as i have and then over here you can't see underneath this thing is this thing i had my dad made it's every this distance there's this little shelf so it's like and it stands alone and so this is where i have current chapters like this is a chapter here all these pages are a chapter from the new book now. and so i have enough 10 slots for the different chapters oh my god exciting you know whatever that's cool. Uh, yeah, I do the same. I, I uh, just carry, you know, I put all my pages in a, a cardboard folder that can fit into my backpack. And if I get tired of just working at my desk here, I'll just go to the coffee shop a block over and 
I can sit there and draw. And that's been pretty yeah. good. You know, it hasn't, I haven't really been able to do that during COVID, but uh, <laughs> that's really been helpful for me, like uh, as far as like my productivity, because sitting inside, it drives you nuts. Just like sitting at the desk here, you get really antsy and, you know. Yeah, I know I had a little nutso thing yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you get them. It's it's worse than COVID. It's true, and I'm, uh, I like the, uh, I like it when I'm out at the farm because it's like when I get crazy like that. When it's like, um, it gets to be too much, and it always gets to be too much. You can go rip on a wall or something, you know. The dog has been losing tufts of hair. Oh, I yeah. saved these to show you. You see this? They've just been coming out in these cute little tufts, and I thought, oh, they look like paintbrush I tips. Miss. <laughs> you make them into a paintbrush. <laughs> I did. I haven't tried it yet. See oh this? my god! So this is a this this here is um a thorn. This is I got trees out there that have these crescent oh, thorns on them. They're called honey locusts. And I made sculptures out of them. I have a bunch of things hanging around here. And I do make sculptures. I do things. But this, these are needle horrible. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is a piece of the thing. And so I took the tuft. I haven't pulled it yet. I haven't tried. And this is just, you know, at first I wired it. And then I used like linen. Uh, thread to go around the make for rule. I wonder how well that's going to work. <laughs> well, I thought I would try it while we were having our thing. So, oh yeah, uh, please. I'm going to take the book called History of Ancient Civilizations, Volume One, The Roman World. Hmm. And we'll set that here. And then we're going to get a piece of paper. We'll use this thing. Are you ready? I'm ready. I wish I could. I'm going to, I want to do a close up of the dip. Oh my gosh. This is the moment. Boy, this is wild, huh? I think if I go in like this, and twirl it. <laughs> Look at that. Ooh, that's like a pinstriping brush. Look at that. Look at that. Okay. It's dr the drips are coming off. Look. Okay. Now let's see if we can draw with this. I'm sure we can, but I don't want to have an ink disaster, so I'm gonna put that there. Are you ready? Yeah. What a beautiful what a beautiful thing, really. Can you see that? Yeah, that's not too bad. It's pretty good. Not bad. Let's see, I'll draw a little two here. Try to draw the dog it came from. The box that it came in. Here's her tufts, her little her little things, and then her nose goes, her muzzle goes like that. Hey, that would be so cool. This is perfect for drawing pets because they're hairy how you get a pointy line yeah oh look at that oh my god carol that's amazing oh it makes a beautiful curve oh <laughs> oh my god look at that amazing <laughs> that. i'm stunned by that I think I've got all these other tufts here that I can make into a brush. I'm going to give it the old water treatment. This is oh, so funny. This wow. is like, you know, Jim Woodring made that oversized pen. Yeah. And this is your version of that. You just made a brush out of a dog hair. Yeah. Oh, dear too, you sweetheart. Now I'll know what to do with your, I was thinking of making a sweater, but forget that. Oh, God. Because they're all over. Okay, we'll let that. Are you a Mormon? I was raised Mormon. I'm not Mormon anymore. Oh, you were? Yeah. My granny was too. 
Really? No kidding. <laughs> this is strange. I I was you know, K through 13 or, or K through 12 Catholic school. And then my parents, of course, we went to church every Sunday and all that stuff. But I remember on my own, my, when, when I came into my first own thoughts, I thought, I don't get this. How come it's like God the Father is a guy, then he's got a son, and the Holy Ghost is a guy, and, I, and there's all these women in the church here, girls. How come there's no like God the daughter or God's the woman? You know, and I thought that feminist thought, I guess you could call it, early. I must have been like four or five, you know. I just remember thinking, Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and the Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother was the only female presence, and she was like unattainable. Yeah. And so from the earliest ages, I had problems. And then I thought, so he sent his son. And then, of course, being in a Catholic family, hierarchical dad, mom, my sister who was joined the convent, she was holy. Then my brother who was um, a jock. Mm. And then there was me. And because I did, you know, it's like the paradigm, the whole thing fell apart. So she must be wild. And then, so I got the designation of being odd and wild and all that stuff. Although I really wasn't, I just was, I don't know, they got to a point, it was like, well, oh, okay. We can't think about that. We got to survive. We got too many things to do. So you asked me about my faith. I had questions from the beginning. And yet when I got to high and I went along. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? You're a child. And they didn't indoctrinate me and I didn't have it as bad as some kids, but I did have the nuns that were like, you know, crazy. <laughs> and some real fun crazy crazy nuns. But you never had like an urge later on as an adult to like, oh, maybe I'll go to church this Sunday and just see if I feel anything sitting there. Well, in high school, it started with, we had a, a teacher who said, um, I took a comparative religions class. I loved that class because then it started to answer some of the questions like, and the assignment was we had to go every Sunday, we had to, check out a different church. So I went to a Methodist service and I went to a Presbyterian. The Catholics were telling me this was back when Catholicism rocked. You know, really after Vatican II, the doors opened and you could um, investigate instead of being behind the, the veil, the priest had his back turned and all that stuff. Suddenly we were participants in the rituals and the rites and women were called to the front and we could be at the altar. And all these things were shocking to me because when I was in the 50s, we were indoctrinated with the idea that if a church was on fire, it was your duty and obligation to run into the burning building and save the host. And then you'd have to clarify your hands. You couldn't touch the body of Jesus and all this stuff. And so <laughs> there was this responsibility. And then here I was in high school and we were holding and we were giving people the body of Christ. Our own hands were touching this stuff. And so that was shocking. And then I found myself able to go to a Jewish temple and places as part of the assignment of seeing like the whole of humanity's response. And I've my whole life maintained an interest in what is a faith response? What is what are the traditions? I did study that and I taught it for a while. In fact, I I landed in Buddhist philosophy as what works because it's not culturally it's been formed into a religion, but it was just an insightful person who Buddha who came to some decisions about the reality and nature of reality and what life is that made sense to me because it wasn't. I mean, when you get into some of the ritual practices that some of the um, cultures have adopted, you know, I don't, I, I falls away. I just like the idea that um, the idea of insight into the true nature of reality and just take it, take it as, take life as it is. So when you, when you look at all the 
major faith traditions and all the they they offer culture a place to you know a, a moral direction mm -hmm. what, how cultures can deal with basically life and death mm -hmm. how people can deal with these issues of life and death which is really when do people like fall down on their knees or praying for a cure they're praying that somebody is, lives or survives the thing um they pray that the baby is going to be fine so people fall on their knees when they need help with the intangible horrible things that we have no control over so then cultures build infrastructures around these comfort places where rites and rituals people need to be connected through marriage because it gives legitimacy to children and and you know and then it gets tied in legally so there's so many points that the human experience needs to have this little extra puffy place that can maybe help to give answers or help people to course through these difficult times yeah and so for me catholicism you know i loved going into the when i was little you know the church it would if you'd hit the pew, it would echo in the church and the smell of candles and the mysteries. I loved all that. And then in high school, like I said, when it turned around and we were holding the host and handing it to people, it took a little of the mystery away, but it also opened the door to the bigger mystery for me of humanity, how humanity responds to the experience of being human. And then <laughs> that thing, even though I cussed and did, did drugs and slept around, I was still interested in what makes people do what they do and how uh, different cultures and traditions interpret the experience. And then I put that into my artwork. So even though, like I said, I've been doing pen work and stuff, I've always been leading with this quest for like, what makes humanity tick and why do they make the choices? Why do people make choices the way they do and how do we respond? to um yeah big uh, heavy religion talking here but yeah. it's what rocks the whole world were you like a, a beatnik when you were a young woman beatnik is the 50s if they didn't they didn't call it that were you what did they call it a hippie later on it was a hippie similar Hip, hippie chicks were 60s i guess and then 70s disco queens <laughs> i don't know <laughs> Where, what, what did you, I mean, you were kind of in between, right? Cause you were too young to be a, like a proper hippie, right? Uh, no, I didn't, I had bell bottoms. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I went to some stoner concerts and ripped out of my head and couldn't slept around. I, I did hippie chick things. Yeah. Okay. There was Beatlemania, which of course everybody knows I got wrapped up in that. Yeah. And then I High school a catholic high school but it was a liberal catholic liberal arts catholic high school which i'm glad of because now it's shifted into oh catholicism is yeah. beatniks were in the 50s the yeah. beat people and then hippies were in you know 60s late 60s and it was yeah it was hard and fast in in california or like 67 68 but we were influenced and it was in the culture and then uh, right out of high school, I was doing, I was hanging with people who were dropping acid all the time and going to concerts. And I lived in the Chicago area, so we'd go down to Grant Park. There were lots of concerts down there, you know, Chicago 68. And then uh, I went up to, there were lots of rock concerts. I had, a, my boyfriend had a bread truck. We were balling in the bread truck, <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, you know, and I had the bell bombs and we smoked pot. I did all that. I married my pot dealer. Oh, yeah. One. But then cocaine is what, what changed it all. Oh, really? Turned into cocaine the 70s? started in 70. Cocaine really started to hit in the mid 70s with disco. Mm -hmm. And that kind of shut the hippie thing down. Oh, okay. You know, you were, you were either going to get into coke or you were going to keep being stoned, which was stupid because nobody was doing that anymore. You were up in your game either with hash or uh, hash oil or mm. uh, flower top or the tops of the pot, you know. So just weed, you know, a lid of weed. Yeah. A lid. Those days were over by the mid seventies. 
I thought then, these were just basically like uh, from like 66 to 69, maybe. And then and then it kind of turns into the 70s. And it's like this weird there no edges to it. It was just really? kind of follow the drugs. <laughs> right. You know, acid was kind of started it up and then the pot and then the kids were, you know, we were all doing the concerts and going around and you either had the slicked back hair and were a greaser. Yeah. You either wore bell box or straight pants. I remember at my wedding in 1971, um, the big thing was all of my husband's to be's, we were ordering the tuxedos, <laughs> ordering the tuxedos in 71. Cause I wanted to have, I, I had a made, do it yourself wedding, but we still, I still wanted to, to wear a wedding dress, mm -hmm. my bridesmaids and, for this is a private moment of triumph. Sorry. Anyway, I lost that cap last night. I was going crazy. Oh, okay. Uh, um, so the moment was, do we order my dad straight tuxedo pants or is he going to get the flares like the brides and like the groom and the rest of them? 1971, July. And he said, I want to be like everybody else. I want the bells. Wow. The plan. <laughs> Wanted the bell bottoms. That was a big thing. I mean, men were wearing white shirts and ties and, you know, real straight laced. And then the big thing was shirts that had uh, any other color than just white. And then the, then it was like bell bottoms. So men's fashions was like, you know, incrementally mm -hmm. uh, in conservative or mainstream or something like that but it was happening so by 71 my dad was just now agreeing that maybe he should wear bell bottoms because he wanted he didn't want to be seen as an old fuddy duddy yeah so you could still buy straight pants well yeah because cornballs wore them and you could still get real cream yeah wow little dabble do you you know you put it on <laughs> look at that hair that was the gross old that meant old old folks you know the old folks yeah. But that was the look, you know, in the 50s and in early 60s, you had to have that. Guys had to have that conk, you know, you had to have that yeah, look. Right. Like the Ken doll hair, right? It's plastic. Yeah. And then so when I was in high school, you were either a greaser or a surfer. Hmm. A greaser meant you did that. You put the grease on your hair. And that usually meant motorcycles and leather jackets and, you know, it seemed like it was old yeah old stuff or a surfer was more inclined to let their hair be a little looser or um so we really didn't call ourselves hippies it was just grease or surf yeah. you were grease surf and my uh hmm. but you yeah. weren't you weren't like uh, uh familiar with underground comics at that point well when i got with my husband bob Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I was looking at him. I was looking at him in that era. I was doing graphic stuff. Mm -hmm. I was doing graphic-y things. I had these little notebooks I kept in high school where you put like, it's Tuesday math class, you know, mm -hmm. sections for your different assignments. Mm -hmm. And I turned those into like, <laughs> because uh, I would just draw all over my notebooks and people would pass them around. It was like, so I was the cool graphics kid making that kind of stuff in my high school. I was the art kid, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, I, and it was because of technology. I had a pen, a, a ballpoint, no, we had, there were ballpoint pens and they had their problems. But when, when I rediscovered the pen that had the cartridge in it. Oh yeah. Then I could just, and then I got into really like, you know, pep rally, I'd write it in block lettering, then I'd make drop shade in the pep rally, you know, and then I'd put stars and I'd, they'd have shades. So I really, because it was either that or take notes on what they were teaching in class. And I just zoned out and did graphics. <laughs> <laughs> and so then when I, when I went on to the thing, get out of there. Yeah. Uh, everybody would look at, I mean, there, they, uh, underground comics and stuff like that were not 
there was no sense of that. You just, for me, you gotta remember, I was from a working class family in a very small region of Northern part of Illinois. So it was, there was no, you know, you get the newspaper, there was a TV set. So there was no, none of the hyper awareness of everything the way there is now. Mm. And so as things would kind of come to you, you could like sort through them. But mostly, it, you know, it was an analog life. I like to swim. I like to drive really fast in a car. You know, <laughs> I like tactile. You know, I like to beat the hell out of nails and stuff. So I was very uh, oh, much into the real world. Yeah. Whereas today it's a lot of- Yeah, right. Stuff. But you entered the comic scene in the eighties, right? As or officially, I guess. But I always, like I'm saying in the early 70s, I did, especially with Bob, my husband there, Alex, Alex. Yeah. We would see the comics, we would read them. And I know I did because I made these trippy hippie comics. I found them the other day, I found these trippy <sighs> comics I was doing in pencil oh. uh, that were really, <laughs> when I look at them, I think, oh my God, these are like dope stoner weird i kept looking i kept what is this thing y'all i'll make a thing really strange uh uh surrealistic were you high when you were doing them i was high a lot but i don't connect that i had to get high to draw or anything but yeah. i did find them the other day and i thought what's What's with these, you know? Uh -huh. uh, I was trying to describe in one of them, it was like a one page and there was like a person sitting at a table, biting into a mushroom, just a regular cook in the frying pan mushroom. And it was like, came a checkerboard. And I was like, these are like eating checkerboards. <laughs> and it was chippy, you know? So, uh, Album cover art was also what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. Yeah. Roundabout and all that. And of course, you know, Beatles covers, I never really spent time looking at them. I never spent a lot of time looking at things. Mostly it was listening and doing things. Because mm -hmm. that's back then, to sit around and look at something was considered a waste of time in my family. You yeah. had to be busy, you had to work. And so I really carried through with that ethic of like staying busy and more more tuning into the sound. Yeah. And so if when you're stoned, you can't work. So you're like, oh. and then but then how much of that was retained is another thing, because that's just stone mind that may not be productive. Yeah. So when I went back to college in the mid 70s, it was paint. Yeah. Because I figured. Well, be a painter. Yeah, I like I like to paint, I like to make images and do things. And it was at the same time I would be in like a, you know, be you know how in college you get with your friends and you really learn about stuff through them, not the professors so much. We would go somebody give a six pack, we'd go back to the house and we would sit there and go over everything. Let's what? talk about Pollock. Oh, yeah, yeah. How old were you at that time when you went back to college? Well, I'd been married. I'd been married for almost six years. So I was older. I was in my mid-20s. I was 25. <laughs> older. <laughs> yeah. And the kids, though, that I was with were um, early 20s. And that was a big difference because it, it would have meant that when I was in high school, they were in elementary school, which was, sure. these are worlds of difference. Yeah. You, I wonder about like what the because so you when you first get your comics published it's in weirdo right that's that's where you first were published what was the I, underground comic scene like at that point was it just basically decimated just people just trying to scrape by to get their work published places and well I can answer it this way when I ended up in New York because I was following I went to graduate school and what happened was Noah was that I felt 
when I talked about these, when we would talk about Pollock, we'd be in these scenes. I would stand up and start talking and telling stories. And people were like laughing and they were listening to me and I had this audience. And so it became obvious that in a single panel, I couldn't tell the story that I wanted to tell. And I was almost ready to just become a stand-up comedian. You know, just do, just talk. Yeah. So when I start to realize that I could put the two together was like a little bit at the end of my L of undergrad, then I went to, or undergraduate, then I went to Syracuse and really put the two together. And it was around that time that I would find myself sometimes at an Art Spiegelman thing. And so it was a connecting in mm -hmm. that way. Yeah. Um, and realizing there was a resurgence. And so I didn't go to San Francisco and check that out until I'd been into graduate school and done all of this stuff. So I didn't make it to San Francisco till the summer of 82. And by then, it was you could go to Hay Ashbury and see tourists taking pictures, you know. It was, and, and uh, deadbeats, you know, people that never left, mm. hanging out and sleeping in Golden Gate Park, you know. Yeah. So the losers and the punks and all of that, um, I don't want to come. I don't want to put punks and losers together. I'm just saying. It was a, <laughs> well, because uh, punks yeah. had some vitality. They were bring. They were really infusing some vitality. And that, that's that was what happened. The hippies were hippies are dead. Yeah. What did uh, uh, Joe Strummer tell us? You know. Yeah, there's a. I have a similar thing. I I I wanted to be a painter as well, but I but I kept trying to make my paintings narrative. And I was always being uh, um, sort of like yelled at about my from my teacher. Oh, of course, because the whole, the whole story. No, putting words. Yeah. I had an artist from New York came to my studio. Studio. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Walter Darby Banner? Nobody does. You'll never paint a masterpiece if you put words in your pictures. Right, right, yeah. So I so. Because I just had a lot of stuff that I wanted to express, so like finding comics seemed like the perfect thing for me. Like, oh, I can actually create art, and I don't have to like, you know, pussyfoot around what I'm trying to say. I could just say it with this art form. You mean I don't have to pretend that I know how to draw really well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, that was the the beauty about alternative comics. I'm like, look at this. I can barely draw, but I have a lot of stuff I want to write about. <laughs> well, you could go that route too, but I always had to dumb it down. I, I wasn't allowed to, because it was called having facility. And facility meant that you were an illustrator, which meant you were not as good as somebody who could just <laughs> splash it on there and then come up with this rationale. Yeah. That was based in, I just, oh, um, I put up with it. I got really good at making, I could make an abstract picture and pull that off. And I still, let me just say, I still love the language of art and I still employ that in the um, work that I do. You know, I'm still very cognizant of shape and relationships and interconnect, uh, what do you call it? Inter, uh, uh, all the things. Yeah. I, you know, never really left. It's I'm hardwired, training wise, not for comics, but for image creation of singular image. Yeah, right. In panel. Yeah. So I like that. And and when I got to the comic scene, I had to relearn. It was well, I hadn't used this in college at all. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So you had to relearn, although I did use it when, when I was married the first time. I worked at a planning commission and I had to use rulers and templates and all that stuff because I prepared zoning case files for two years. It was very technical. I had a drawing board and a drafting machine. I'd use rapidiographs and all that. Oh, that's cool. And so, I, I, yeah, I loved, that. I loved that, that you could just, there was a technical thing. And then when you finished the job, you were done. Mm -hmm. Whereas with art, you know, you're like fooling with it. You're not sure where you're at. And then all this art garbage comes in your head like, you know, is it done? When is it done? How does an artist know it's art? When is it done? How would you do a figurative? Blah, 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 all that speak. 
got me nuts. I wonder, do you, when you finish Soldier's Heart, when that's done and you turn the files in, do you have a little bit of postpartum depression after that, after you turn in a project like that? Because you put so much work into it and so much thought and it means so much. And then when it's over and out of your life, are you, do you go through a period of just like, now what? Are you preparing for that with your next book? Is I, that it? I'm, I know it's coming. I'm, in fact, I already feel it because, you know, the other day, I'm going to tell you a story here. I, I was working on this page where it's basically, I know this is the end of these characters in the book. Like, this is the last time I'm going to draw them on this page. And they're saying goodbye to each other. And as I'm drawing this page, I spent four years drawing these characters. I have Dennis Wilson's song Forever playing in my headphones. And I just started crying because it just made me so sad. It was like, all of a sudden I realized like, I'm not going to draw these people anymore. <laughs> and I, they felt so real to me and stuff. And then that song is so sweet. It, I got really emotional about it. So now, like I was telling my wife, like, I think I'm going to need to go on a vacation or something when this is done. And I, I can't just sit at home and not do anything. I'm going to be really depressed about it. Because it does become your life, you know, working on a, a project. Now, you your question was, well, how, did I have a more period of like detached like depression? Because you because you put so much time into that book and so much effort and stuff, and, and it is about your own life and you know. Your own and it's a doorstop. That's the way I feel about it. It became a nice doorstop because nobody reads it. That that can't be true. That book is really successful. People they see on the front that it's something to do with military, and then they're like, I don't like the military, and they're not going to read it. Or um, military people don't like it because it's about the weakness. It's weakness. You know, you have PTSD. A real warrior is not going to have that problem, even though we've been chipping away at that in our culture about how that's not true. It's, we're asking way too much of people at times. Yeah. Um, um, that doesn't matter, though. How did you, I mean, did it make you just finishing a big project like that? Do you feel sad and, and like you need to figure out what you're going to do next immediately? Or like, how do you deal with that? It, it, that's a very difficult question because uh, I was dealing with real people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, this book I'm doing now is about the aftermath of that, which you just described. Uh, okay. So I tell stories about my dad, my mom, their story, and looking back at history and trying to tell my dad's story because I, I, at first my motivation was I really could see that 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 was passing, mm -hmm. passing away. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of me was trying to get grab the historical record. Yeah. My parents are from, they represent a period of time and a place that is gone. It's going to be gone. It's already gone. It's gone now. I've seen it go. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, then who are you doing it for? Unless it strikes a universal chord. And of course, a soldier store, any soldier that's anybody who's done anything of any significance um, is going to have a, there's going to be a chord of recognition at some point in there. Yeah. So while they were doing it, they were getting sick and dying and I had to take care of them. Mm -hmm. So then that was like syncopation, the book. Oh no, wait, this one died, wait. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, it's done, hey, look, it's done everybody. Wait, nobody's left, they're all dead. Yeah, and it, doesn't that change the, the narrative that you're working on as it's, as it's happening? You're working on something well, as the it's- The one I'm doing now, it, I'm trying to, uh, uh, sort through all of that because at first it was like okay soldier's heart is done I need to get into the next one and then I had written down volumes about what happened during that time and in there is poetry and in there is junk together mm -hmm. I gotta sort through that I gotta get to it and I found that the the loss of them and the change in my life and not only losing people to death but losing loved ones to stupid things yeah happened at the same time so i was out there on an island hmm. and uh i thought is this a good if i start a book now if i or, okay i'm going to start the book and then i found i couldn't do it 
And it was because I was too fried and unfocused about exactly what it is that I was trying to say, because there's so much of it. Do I focus on you? Do I want to continue to tell people, is, is this just chapter whatever of soldiers? No. <clears throat> and then I found feelings for the, I found a whole range of feelings that didn't fit, you know? So there was so much, it was like, oh. it's like, I know what I have to do is gonna take me fucking 10 more years. I don't want to do another soldiers. Oh, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in a drawing table. I want to cut loose. Yeah, what was the um, first comic that you did? Was it Southern Men? Again. Oh, that I ever did? That I ever did? Well, the one first one that was ever published. Oh, no, it was something terrible that Aileen published. And when we got done, it was, we were both like, ah, that's bad. Oh, really? <laughs> then I did, uh, I like the one in Weirdo 20. Though I was in 18, I think I was in 19. There was a maybe a one pager. Then I when I did uh, uncovered property, that was kind of the one that was like, okay, this is what I need to be doing stuff like this. That was a five or a six pager. Mm -hmm. was an, maybe book. it was an eighty seven or something like that. Yeah. What was this book? I can never find this a copy of this book you did called Ink Party. Because <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> oh really? Oh, that's why. Okay. I, I, I sent the proposal into uh, Kim in uh it was between this and that i said i said hey it was before that late bloomer thing which was his title I don't oh, claim like it. That? oh that's a good title <laughs> um, uh he's i said i think we should i was busy with life and i couldn't get something new so it's time for a collection let's let's put out this, I'll call it Ink Party. And then I did the cover and he thought it was stupid and they made fun of me. Oh. And then, but he went ahead and got an ISBN number and got it ready. And it's funny cause it's, it's it appears in places like this book. It's like, where's this, where's this book? <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, what's it gonna be? Was it, is this gonna be collecting this stuff? Basically be kind of half of the late bloomer stuff. Cause I, I ended up putting late bloomer, I was proud of the way I put it together. I'll say that, you know, it was like, this is what I did in the eighties. This is what I did in the nineties. This is what I've done in the two thousands. And I had segments and I showed my kid getting older cause it was all about the stuff I did when she was little. I was like, here she, I did this stuff when she was a baby. I did this stuff when she was a school age kid. And I did this stuff in, when she was in high school. And I did try to make it, make a theme with the mother and the child and the end pages you know I tried to make that and then the chapter has so i've tried to put some post-production of specific things but the raggedness what i like about it too is the ragged like the first part the stuff in the 70s is mostly black and white or the 80s mostly black and white because that's what technology allowed us to print mm -hmm. and then the second part was you could see color coming in because drum scanners were invented and it was cheaper it was just as cheap to do color and it could do my watercolor techniques and whatever. And then at the end, I was getting more inventive with making the lines themselves have color and yeah, yeah, yeah. more complicated, uh, going back to some complicated issues. But the thing about Late Bloomer is it doesn't have, it's not comprehensive. It's just stuff that was not in the job thing, which was stuff that I had work related. And there's a lot of ragged stuff in that. So it's part it's part of a retrospective. Well, Late Bloomer is my favorite, one of my favorite graphic novels, and one of my I mean my favorite thing of yours. Honestly, I, I reread that book all the time. It's it's great. It's great stuff. Well, thank you. That's it's it's. I think when you when, when you look at person's early stuff, everybody likes every. I I like people's early stuff because it's almost like you puke it out before you have filters. Mm -hmm. what? You know. Did you scan did you scan and put your stuff together yourself or do you send it to Fantagraphics to do? The whole soldier's heart was done by email. Oh, really? You just sent yeah. it? Uh, I, and the, back in the day, you would take your page mm -hmm. and you'd 
cut some cardboard, tape the edges, put the address on there, take it to FedEx, take it to the post office. We always had to mail the original art early on. And then when, when the whole internet thing came, you would make, like I finally, I used to do them at, at the school. So I finally was able to afford my own flatbed scanner. Now I have an oversized flatbed scanner. Nice. It will fit the pages. And then the worst thing is the Photoshop process. That takes as much, time, sometimes as much time as the actual making of the work. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm not totally proficient with it. I'm pretty good at it, but I don't create on the Photoshop. Mm -hmm. I use it as a cleanup tool. So like for some reason, this paper, this Strathmore yeah. stuff. Um, by the way, this, this book I'm doing about death is in black. <laughs> that's good all right so um because color was taking a hell of a long time i like can imagine long... especially the way huh? you do it i've never seen anybody color like you these you do these dashes these color dashes that are on top of each other they're like layered i Thank always you. i'm gonna rip i'm gonna rip that off i'm gonna you're gonna see that wind up in my own in my books <laughs> nobody i'm against the stealing <laughs> you couldn't see Stop it. The <laughs> no, I've been doing uh, everything in all those marks in pen now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so when you scan a page like that, I've um, something happens. I don't know. The page comes out dark. I don't know if I need to recal. I, I don't know how to recalibrate this. Scanner. Yeah. So I to go into levels and then then you can't go too much or it eats away at the ink lines and it's tricky. And then I thought about that. It's like, hey, you know, it would be so simple and quick. Just put color in the background and do the thing where you lift the line and put it on there. I know people do that, but mm -hmm. I can't to me that I can't do that because it's like, I have to build it. I'm interested in the piece. Yeah. This page is what it is. And mostly the corrections are, um, oh, I misspelled a word the other day. And if I misspell your correlation, if I misspell a word, I put a dot. Oh, okay. It's margin. And then I know I got to go into Photoshop and move it over. It's all pencil. Here, this one's in progress down here. It's almost done. Here's the pencil. This will mm -hmm. end up looking like that and so on. Okay. Uh, I don't Good. do any sketches ahead. Of it's a matter of what are you trying to say? What do you want? How do you want to show that thing? Okay. There's a lot of laying in bed and mm -hmm. visualizing. It's crazy because you know it when it's there. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, you know I, that. Do you know who does really good? You color? force things, then you draw it, and then you redraw it. You redraw it. It's like it's just not right. And if you just leave it the hell alone, eventually, it's like. I know exactly what I want to do. And then you sit down, you do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, somebody who was really good with color was Richard Sala, who I used to think like, he must be yeah. or something. You see his originals, you're like, holy shit, how did he do that? <laughs> he like wasn't tinkering around. I mean, what you saw was what it looked like that, you know, he was just such a master. Yeah, because we, that was the way, that was the way we were, uh, you color on, I don't see it. I mean, I know there are other ways, but for me, it's just like, now, wait a minute, I'm having to suspend closure of the decisions I'm making on the page. I'm deferring that to this other step. Mm. What, why don't I just do it? Do it here, do it right here. Um, I mean, I do use, like I said, I use Photoshop, but I don't use it as a, 
as a creative tool. Hmm. And I know I see people, they're like, oh, I, I knocked out a page, six pages last night. And I look at the pages, it's like digitized fonts, <laughs> computerized color. No wonder you got it done so quick. <laughs> and I don't want to judge people on that. Yeah. Because apparently it's not something that people care about anymore. Yeah. You know, people are not like, it's not a standard of, of judgment or critique or criteria. I consider my pages as pieces of art. So there you go. I'm not going to go to the gallery and say, oh, and you know what? You should see this thing in color. Yeah, I did this. It's like, because if, if first and foremost, it's like, am I considering this page for like, is this about the printed final or is this about making art? And for me, of course, it's my art form. So of course I'm gonna do whatever moves I need to do. I'm not saying that I won't try that. I don't know, but also sitting at the computer, I get infrastructure problems with my neck and arm and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I tend to find myself stuck in the same yeah. spot. And it's like two hours have gone by. It's like, get up, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. So um, the argument continues and people are gonna do what they're gonna do. And I, I'm not gonna judge or criticize anybody, but for me, I feel like uh, that's a shortcut that I can't take. Are you? Do you sell your originals or do you keep them all? Because that's where the value is. Right. You know, you, you, you're going to make uh, a book, like the, the Soldier's Heart pages in full color mm -hmm. are what they are. They're, they're, my big beef was that in, I did not like the, why, the you'll never know, the, the whole thing got muddled because I mean, Kim got sick, but I didn't like, something. I don't like this book. I don't like the way it looks. And it's because the um, printing totally did not serve the beauty of the pages themselves. Hmm. And so in Soldier's Heart, I was having fits being shitty to people. It's like, look at the difference between this page and you'll never know. And the original, they're not the same. Okay. The original is intricate. It's got all this beautiful things going on. And this is, it's blanched out and too dark and this and that. I finally got the production people to see that at Fantagraphics. And then they got the printers to see that there was something funky. They couldn't just go back and use their old things. Something was wrong. And so most of it got corrected, thank goodness, in Soldier's Heart. Yeah. With Soldier's so Heart. I, I don't want to go through that again. Yeah. This yeah. is hard enough to do this page about this book about death. I don't want to, I don't want to care, but yet when I go and scan these in and try, try to fix them, I find that they're, they're equally as difficult. Hmm. Um, was Soldier's Heart, uh, did it go into multiple printings? It's a doorstop, honey. <laughs> I mean, that, that seems like it was, I mean, when that book came out, that was a big deal. That's, that's my, from my perspective, like it was all over the place. You know, they did a really good. Um, yes. Um, the problem with that is the problem is that because it had custom, and this is why people use digitized lettering, because you can translate it. Nobody told me that any of that along the way. It could, you can easily take the balloon here and insert Finland language, Finnish, or, you know, some other language. And so with Soldier's Heart, because there's so much the lettering themselves take on shapes and there's so much yeah. of that. You would have to that, do it. Uh, and I said, I'll be happy to do it. I had a guy from, when I was in Italy, mm -hmm. uh, this guy said, oh, I wanna do this. It's like, let's do it because half this book, you know, half of my dad's experience, he talks about Italy all the time. He talks about France. It should be in French and Italian and German. Yeah, it should. Yeah, I just, I've, I've been underserved. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're one of, you know, you're a legendary cartoonist. When they put together that, that uh, conference on comics, you were there. No, I mean, there's a reason why I asked you to, 
chat with me. <laughs> it's because I know that people are. Okay, so I know that, and you know what? I appreciate that. I've worked really hard. I want the. I've always wanted the work to speak for itself. I'm not. I'm not bearing a grudge. I'm not grinding an act. No. Yeah, I understand. I'm just saying that there's been a couple of points that have kept me from really. And one of them is early on, it was a boys club, mm. you know, and then I changed my name to C. Tyler thinking, okay, I'll take the woman thing out of it. And just, just be C. Tyler, right? Yeah. And then C. Tyler got disconnected from me because it's like, I don't know. Yeah. And then I decided, eh, it's just going to be myself. I don't care. And then a lot of people were saying, well, you know, she's married to a famous cartoonist. So of course, you know, it's like, no, I, I've been working, earning this on my own. Hmm. Um, I'm working hard. I'm trying yeah. to make this make this happen for myself. And then um, uh, the boys club thing was big. But and that's then uh, that's kind of falling stupid. Apart. Yeah, it's kind of falling apart. Then it, now it's now it's age. You know, well she's old, or she's she's the lady did the uh, soldier thing, a uh, uh, military. So. I, I don't know. I can't. Uh, I don't care about stuff like that anymore. Yeah. It's like but those are been, those have been some of the factors along the way that have come, and it's just interesting to note. Think about that. But this is true, and I've brought this up all through this conversation. Is that technology is really what pushes the things forward for me? I said the technology. I had the pen in high school that allowed me to do. Mm -hmm. great doodly graphics mm -hmm. in my assignment notebook so if i if it had been a ballpoint pen i wouldn't have been as inclined to want to make bubble letters or whatever i ended up doing mm -hmm. right lines and, stuff. and then the technology learned at the zoning commission you know i had to yeah. learn this technology which then was you know you can do it over there but i learned the basics there and then the technology the day that somebody said oh try a pointy brush as opposed to you know a big old one of these so the technology now is do i use a stylus or my finger to do that thing look at what what's his name is doing uh that painter people hated what he did on the new yorker cover Oh, I didn't like it. David Hockney, I didn't I didn't like that. Okay, I thought you were about to defend that. Yeah, I was grossed out. No, I hated it. Yeah, that was I like his physical work. Do you I saw that you bought like a bunch of those pen nibs that you can't get they don't manufacture anymore. You still have those? Ten thousand nibs, you bet. In fact, I cracked out a box last night. Is that the same kind that Charles Schultz was using? I have no idea, but you know. I looked at this box of thousands of nibs, right? I don't know how many is in here. Okay. And I was going, oh no, I'm gonna run out. <laughs> I don't know. And I have like 10 boxes. So because this pen point I've been using, I keep trying to show with a great background so you can see it. Uh -huh. This this pen point I've been using, I did I've used this for maybe 30 of the pages so far, it's held up. But, you know, I've got, I'll tell you this. Do, 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 do. Happy pen music. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, I know I'm a fossil. I don't care. Do, 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 do. I know the kids don't care, but eventually maybe they'll grow up and they might. So here's the current like group. This one here, there's, there's a, I, I don't know where these pinpoints came from. I have a few of them. How long do they last? Well, now this guy, I've been using for some super fine lines. Mm -hmm. Love it. And these are all that same old 788 that I just showed you. Mm -hmm. But as you use them, I gotta line them up. As you use them, they get, uh, you know, they have a, at the end, they're like this. And then the ink is up here in the well. Let's find a finger. You see this, how there's like a hole? Yeah. Okay. So the ink, so the, ink the ink goes 
down here. Yeah. So um, after a while, you press, 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 press. They start to do that. Mm -hmm. And so like, I know, for example, this one's holding up on a good medium sized line. This one's already gone fat. So if I wanna make a outline or it doesn't matter so much. And I think this one's hopeless too. So they do wear out depending on how much control you want over the thickness of the line, and how, how much it matters, you know? So like when you're lettering, when you're doing lettering, like, like anybody can see that. <laughs> um, and I've departed from my usual. Um, I'm doing upper and lower for the first time in my life. I'm doing upper and lower. Can you see that? Oh yeah, I can see it. Okay. I used to do all caps and I love all caps. And then with Fab Four, I started doing like combining cursive and up and, and, and lettering because it turns out that people can't read cursive. And the whole back of the book, Fab Four Mania, the whole back part is the actual. Yeah. What happened at the concert, right? And I did it in a red ballpoint pen in cursive. And that had to be, for the historical record, I wanted that accurate. Mm -hmm. So here's how it looked. When I was 13, I took a pen, a red pen, and I went, rrr, rrr, I wrote it the way the nuns taught me. And so with comics, I'd always taught the students, never, ever use upper and lower. It just looks low grade. You got to do it. But then I, through Fab Formania, I really studied the lettering on how to make I, it's literally a primer. If you read Fab Four Mini, read page after page after page, it prepares the reader visually to be able to read your cursive at the end. Yeah. So there are a couple places where I'll make a T, and then I'll make a cursive H, and then a regular E. And so within the context of that, you know it's the word the, and then there's the H mm -hmm. in cursive. And so honestly, it was a conscious decision. And as you go through it, by the time you get to the all cursive, it's like, you can do it. Because you've been reading all along as I've been slipping the hints in. That's the teacher in me. Yeah, yeah. I know Crumb uses a, uh, what is it? I don't have it here. He uses the uh, Coroquil. Oh, OK. Is that, my, is that a dragging pen? All of my pages, I would be here forever. Forget it. Yeah. But it's it's a use those pens you drag. You can't just do all sorts of directions with that. Right? This? Yeah. Don't you use a? I thought you used a pen. No, no, I just use uh, uh, rapidographs. Oh no, th these you. I tell my students never push up with it. You pull the point. You pull it. Okay. And you have to figure out the ways to pull it. Like there's, you know, what direction and your hand is going to be doing things like because you, and you never pound it on its point because you're going to make that thing go wow. And then it's metal. Eventually it, it won't work at all. So you have to, and then because it has this thing, I said, I got all those rags. You take a rag, dip it in the ink, use it for a while. And because right now in the winter, it's so hot mm -hmm. in here from heat. And even when I turn it down and I've gotten to where I keep it super cool in here and I have a, a heating pad underneath that drawing panel so that I can keep my fingers warm. Yeah. Um, because the ink dries on here and the ink formulas. Here we go again. The ink has gotten so shitty because they don't care anymore. There's so few of us that do this. This ink, I use this stuff, super stuff. I've used, I've, I had for a while, I was creating my own formulas of this stuff here they all have names and stuff and i have different signifiers to make them look like you know so i can recognize the differences of them you know the different things like that in soldier's heart i use these i put the colored ink in these little containers like that 
And so I know that like that was mom's hair or this was dad's jacket or, or my jacket or something. So I had like 53 colors of colored ink I used for soldier's heart. So that was madness. He stumped down to one thing, black. And this has been acrylic, acrylicized. Yeah. Made into a, uh, It's thicker. It, it dries. And so when I'm working, you'll get to a certain point and it's just gum. Mm -hmm. So you have to stop. And I used to could just go like this and clean off the pen point and it'd be okay. But now it's so bad. You can see on this one, it draw, it's drying on the edges. The ink is drying on these side edges. Mm -hmm. That's how, and so I have to dip the pen in the water now and go like this to clean it. So how often do you clean a pen off? I mean, part of me says, well, if I had just a pen, like here's a Tombow, if I just use that and would it go quicker? And then uh, it's like, but then I wouldn't be dipping a pen. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing, you know, I'm a pen dipper. So you just basically, a pen is a point, a vehicle for a point. Some points are fatter than others, thicker. And then when you work the pen, yeah, there are some little rules and regulations you have to use to make sure that you are pulling But this book I'm doing right now about uh, grief, mm -hmm. I am going off in directions I haven't tried again, but that's because I'm not trying to pander to an audience. I'm doing it because I want to try a couple of different modes that I've never approached in, in doing my comics before, and I'm excited about it. I need to stay excited or I'm not going to work, right? Because right. I feel like I don't really, anything I have to say that's uh, you need in terms of information, you can find it somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, what happens to the body after you die? That mm -hmm. stuff's out there. I don't need to talk about that. But what, what I had to do was create a world and a character and a situation that uh, goes into the interpretation and the themes in a different way that to me was more compelling than what I'd ever done, the way I'd ever approached it before. So yeah. it's like, have some fun. And if the kids like it, they will like it. If they don't, well, I know that 35 and up. There you go. We'll read it. Yeah. That's why I think Soldier's Heart, if it had come out maybe even 10 years earlier, I think uh -huh. Soldier's Heart, uh, You'll never know book one came out in like 2008 or nine or something like that. Right. That's because, I, you know, I had responsibilities. I couldn't get to it. But um, if I had just a man book had come out 10 years early. Oh, yeah. When there were more old guys still alive and people, you know, who I hear most from now are uh, the children and grandchildren of people who are damaged by war oh. if they find it because it's it's like everything it's not it's not the popular thing right now so. mm -hmm. and it, they people will not consider it military history although it is yeah so uh i don't know i'm you know what's happening with the beetle book right now beetle maniacs are discovering it and what? beetle mania is really you got your core beetle people like me who were there Paul and Ringo are still with us. And then you have people that liked the Beatles growing up, but they weren't Beatle maniacs. And now we're starting to get people who are discovering the Beatles as young people, and they think they're really cool. And they want to know more. So I'm going to be in this conference. And this is, we're talking now. But what's happening with me with Beatle mania is as Beatlemania, as Beatlemania, that world of Beatle fans and Beatle people, it's like, this is really important literature. <laughs> so that book will jump from being a 
interest to the graphic novels community to being something that Beatles people are going to pick up and keep going. Yeah, that's cool. And the same's going to happen with your book. Well, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the Mormon uh, Tabernacle Choir will be singing yeah. part of it. There you They'll go. turn it into an opera. All right. Well, I got to let you go now because it's. I took a lot of your time.